Hello and welcome to today's current affairs. Today is 24 January 2023 and we are going to see the following news articles. Their relevance is given here. We will move to the first article of the day which is about High Court of Andhra Pradesh's Chief Justice talking about some violation made by the vacation bench of the concerned High Court. So basically the Andhra Pradesh High Court Chief Justice, he has reprimanded the vacation bench saying that they have acted in a hasty manner in a particular order of the AP government in a case related to particular order of the AP government. So this is the news article. In this context we have to know what is vacation court. So, a vacation court is basically constituted by the Chief Justice of India in Supreme Court and the Chief Justice of the concerned High Court in respective High Courts. And this vacation court is even constituted in trial courts which are the lower courts. So, why this vacation court is needed? That is because both the Supreme Court as well as the High Court take two long vacations one is the summer break and another is the winter break as we already know there is a huge pendency of cases and also to enable speedy delivery of justice and to give priority to matters of particular importance this vacation bench is constituted. So, what is an urgent matter that is not defined anywhere in any act or rules that is left to the discretion of the court? And uh, what is the legal provision for vacation bench? Uh, in the Supreme Court rules of 2013, in the rule 6 of order 2, uh, it is mentioned that CJI can nominate a division bench for this case. So, uh, the CJI generally appoints a single judge for this. Generally, um, it is not just restricted to one judge. In most cases, two judges are at least appointed. A bench of two judges are at least appointed for this purpose in a Supreme Court as well as the High Courts. And the next thing we have to know about is lunch motion petition. So basically uh, the Chief Justice prepares the roster. Roster means the order in which the cases will be heard. And he is the master of the roster. That means the Chief Justice will decide in what order the cases will be heard. And it is left to the discretion. But in case there is a necessity then this lunch motion petition can be used. In this, the emergency cases are heard out of turn due to their importance. And these cases are generally heard after lunch. That is why they have gotten the name lunch motion petition. And another term that is related to this article is quorum non judice. So this is the Latin word for not before a judge. So, this word is used or this term is used whenever a judge is taking upon himself something that is beyond his jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the sphere of operation of a judge. So, if we take Andhra Pradesh High Court, the sphere of jurisdiction of a judge of Andhra Pradesh High Court is the territory of Andhra Pradesh and it is concerned with matters of judicial importance. That judge cannot breach into the legislative domain. If there is excess of jurisdiction that is happening, then it is termed as quorum non judice. The Advocate General of Andhra Pradesh State mentioned that the judgment of the vacation bench is quorum non judice and hence it is not enforceable which means that the judgment is beyond their jurisdiction and by virtue of that this particular judgment is not enforceable and it is related to an order passed by the Andhra Pradesh government which is not important for our purposes. We need to concentrate more on the 
static part of this what are the legal provisions what are the terms associated with this news article the next article is from the editorial section it is about the draft data protection bill uh, so first we will see the background information and then i will summarize this article for you right to informational privacy as a fundamental right first came about as a result of ks puttaswami case this is very important because sometimes in prelims there is a question asked or there is a statement given in which this particular right is associated with this particular case sometimes that is asked and this case that is the ks puttaswami case is very very important in that regard not only from prelims point of view even when you write mains answers you can quote this case after this puttaswami judgment during the debate that was happening about data protection justice shri krishna committee was constituted and they suggested digital personal data protection bill and this was in 2018 based on the recommendations and suggestions made by this committee a data protection bill was introduced and at present it is with a joint parliamentary committee basically we need a digital data personal data protection bill because the current it rules which were drafted in 2011 they are not adequate to deal with the present day complications the world today is vastly different from what it was in 2011 at that time social media sites were not that popular at that time social media sites were starting to get used for political mobilization but now it is widely used even teenagers use social media and online presence is also a part of life it has become a part of identity in this context a data protection bill which is very much relevant for the modern times is necessary uh, so what is the application of this bill so this bill it deals with processing of personal data which is collected online or even offline but if it is stored in a digitized format and the scope of the bill is that it covers the processing of personal data which is collected by data fiduciaries within the territory of india so for example data fiduciaries are social media companies when you sign up you input some of your data with them and uh, as and when you start using your account you are also um loading more and more data into the account say for example you are using a twitter account right uh, you will tweet continuously that is your personal data which is collected by that social media company right so this is personal data an example of personal data to make it over simplified i'm just telling this to make you understand what is it you cannot quote this straight away in your examination that is an example of personal data which is collected by data fiduciaries or when you apply for an examination uh, different data of yours are collected your name age your father's name your educational details all these things are collected now the institution stay, say it is a state psc they become data fiduciary in this case this is just one example so this particular uh, bill when it becomes act it will cover processing of personal data which are collected by data fiduciaries within the territory of india so what are the features of a good data protection bill so uh, when we study about the features we have to segregate and study it in terms of data fiduciary data principles what is the right of individuals what is a data protection board what provisions must be there regarding cross border flow like this we have to sectionalize compartmentalize and study okay so first of all data fiduciary i already explained who or what is a data fiduciary they have an obligation of data minimization which means 
they have to collect only as minimum data as possible okay collection limitation how much data they can collect there has to be limitation placed on these data fiduciaries purpose limitation they can collect data only for a particular purpose they can't state any purpose and collect the data so the purpose is limited by virtue of this act and storage limitation how long can they store that data where can they store that data these are all some of the restrictions imposed on the data fiduciary for the protection of data now data principles data principles we are the data principles we originate data data comes from us so we are the data principles i am a data principle you are a data principle right so i or you we have rights that comes under the rights of data principles right of correction you can go and correct your data um in case you have changed your gender say for example you can go and correct that data right of erasure the data can be erased if you feel that a particular company is not responsible enough to hold your data you can even request for erasure right to be forgotten that is once your data is in the current structure once your data goes up in the public domain in the internet you cannot expect to be forgotten somewhere in the archives you are always there so if there is a data protection bill there will be legal provisions which stipulate right to be forgotten and there should also be nominee provision because um, we used to funnily say that what will happen to our facebook accounts when we die right so what will happen to our data which is stored across many platforms across many data fiduciaries like we appoint a nominee for our bank holdings we'll also appoint a nominee for our data who will decide what should be done with our data once we are away from the physical body right and right of portability say if i want to change my network from one mobile company to another mobile company i have the right to port my number similarly if i am going from one service provider to another service provider there should be right of portability and there should be increased protection to sensitive personal data like one sexual orientation like the diseases a person has all these are sensitive data and what should be the rights of individuals individuals should have access to information regarding how or why the data is collected how it is stored for what purpose it is used all all those things come under access to information then right to consent they can uh, the consent clause should be broken down into several parts so that i as a data principal i can read through that and give an informed consent and there should also be right to withdraw consent after a point of time if i am unsatisfied i can also withdraw consent to hold my data right to erasure or correction which we have seen already and in order to implement all these Uh, they should not just be in paper right we need a data protection board that will ensure compliance and in case of any breach consumers can file complaint to this data protection board and regarding cross border data flow the data flow can be only to notified countries which have a similar data security landscape as our country and then financial penalties if the data fiduciary which is the company if it is showing non compliance they can be fined from rupees 5 to 500 crores and the data principal in case of false documents they can be fined up to an amount of rupees 10000 and uh, all these uh, rights they can be exempted in the case of national security so what are the concerns associated with data protection so uh, there is reduced information on what are the rights of an individual there is reduced awareness on this issue and what will happen in case of 
data portability as such the data is not received in a structured format if we have to transfer data across devices across platforms there has to be an interoperability so data portability there are, there are questions about it say for example uh, if i am making a document and i am sending it to my friend if i am making the document in word 2003 and the uh, my friend is using another version of word like word 97 so obviously there is not interoperability or portability the same document would appear differently probably the alignment would have been hey wire in my friends document right so that is data portability to give you a candid example and uh, what about switching platforms how to switch platforms uh, that is if i want to go to a um, social media site there is a twitter clone that is coming up and i want to switch to the other clone what will happen in that case that is about switching platforms and there are concerns about data localization which means localization of data is indians data should be stored in servers located within india the data should not be taken outside the jurisdiction of india to be stored if that happens the indian government will not have authority to enforce anything on the particular data fiduciary and what are the concerns related to collection limitation in the present form of the bill collection limitation clauses removed i already e- explained what is collection limitation it is the um, restriction that is imposed on the data fiduciary about what data they can collect and there is no protection for sensitive personal data government control over personal data uh that is also questionable in the current format of the bill because government is the largest data holder uh in terms of pan card passport aadhar card so government is the largest data holder so in that case also there are questions about the bill in its current format and personal data of minor it is said that there is excessive parental control so what should be the suggestions these are the suggestions overall for the entire personal data protection bill uh, there should be a statutory status that is given to data protection board that is a legal backing should be given to data protection board and uh, there should be compensation provided to data principals in case of breach at present there are provisions for fining the data fiduciaries in case of breach so a component of compensation to the data principals should also be provided and regarding data portability the provisions should become more comprehensive and to make our law a very robust mechanism there can be models that can be emulated from european unions gdpr that is the general data protection regulation this has been implemented in eu right from 2020 we can also take a leaf out of their book and implement similar provisions in india so that uh, there would be more compliance also already the international companies are complying with eu's gdpr if we also model our law in those lines it is it will be easy for compliance and it will incentivize these companies to follow a regime of data product protection and we'll have state of the art mechanisms also if we are going to emulate the eu model now this is the background we saw about what was the origin of data protection what is the necessity for a new bill what are the characteristics of a good data protection bill in case of data principles data fiduciaries the portability of data rights everything now we'll come to the article the article is particularly talking about safety of teenagers in online platforms like instagram facebook etc so uh, in the current format the responsibility is shifted to parents 
so what happens is uh, the data fiduciaries are basically uh, imposing this responsibility on uh, sorry uh, these data fiduciaries are imposing this responsibility for safety of an online space to the parents themselves instead the data fiduciaries should create a conducive environment and in the current format the law is against best interests of the child this particular term it comes from the convention on child rights and all the laws in our country be it posco act or child rights commission act juvenile justice act all these laws take into account best interests of the child but this particular dpdr in case of uh, teenagers it is going against the principle of best interests of the child so why is it so because online presence is a part of growing up process these days they are like um, tech natives that is the term that is used because they always had access to technology they always have seen these platforms like twitter facebook youtube etc they always had the exposure it is unlike the previous generation which got to know about these platforms in their growing up years but today's teenagers are tech natives so there is this verifiability clause in the law uh, that is the social media company they have to verify the identity that is uh, they also have to verify the age of the user so what happens is when the company resorts to age verification actually more data is collected right this goes against the principle of data minimization which says that as less data should be collected as possible which we saw previously also that is one thing next thing is instead of like relegating the responsibility to the parents uh, the online platforms they should perform risk assessment how far their platform is risk free for teenagers they should do the self assessment so there will be an environment of co regulation wherein government is also regulating and this platform is also self regulating and in india the age limit is still 18 years but in case of eu's gdpr teenagers are defined that is the age of consent is made as 13 years with respect to online presence we can probably make it possible in india also the same thing and why this is necessary because it balances the safety of the children also the agency of the children if everything is imposed on parental regulation it would be too controlling of an environment for teenagers so uh, a, a safety of the child it's not just the responsibility of the parent it is a responsibility of the society itself that is why the authors of this article are saying that the onus should be on all of the stakeholders here the parents are made singularly responsible which should not be the case and nuance should be taken into consideration wherein the agency of the child is also taken into account and the accountability of the social media platform is also taken into account so this is a comprehensive analysis on this bill from a general perspective and also from the perspective of child rights and teenager rights and the next is also from the editorial section it is about allowing foreign universities in india though we have seen an article about this in our previous sessions this warrants even more detailed discussion because the provisions have clearly come up so a well rounded criticism is given in this article so i have picked this article so draft ugc setting up an operation of campuses so this is wrong it's supposed to be campuses of foreign higher educational institutions in india regulations 2018 so with regard to this draft ugc regulations there are some concerns 
first we will see the concerns of regulators uh, how to promote excellence if the foreign universities are allowed to operate in india how the regulators can promote excellence how the regulators can prevent malpractices how the regulators can safeguard the interest of students and at the same time protect national interest because the culture of these institutions would be different the values that they espouse will be different and in case of financial interoperability syllabus courses also national interest has to be kept into account and how is the regulator going to achieve that and next thing is cultural threat as i already said the values and the levels of exposure in these kind of institutions are not a average not of an average indian culture kind culture itself is a relative term but still there is this common culture that is the popular culture of india how far these institutions institutional culture would be conducive to overall indian culture what would be the consequences of this and how would the regulator deal with this that is also a concern how to attract best universities if we are doing so much to bring in foreign universities we want the best of the best right so how to attract them like how we attract businesses how do we attract best of the best foreign universities to india and what are the concerns of foreign universities which want to set up shop in india so there might be an adverse effect there might be an uh, there might be a possibility of adverse effect on their ranking and reputation that might be because of the fact that if they set up shop in india they have to adhere to ugc regulations to the governmental regulations which might affect their autonomy which might affect their admission procedure etc so it might have a effect on ranking and reputation that is their con their concern next thing is um countries would require them to subsidize the cost of operation in that case the autonomy of these institutions are affected and they are also concerned by the fact about repatriation of funds so if they have to shift funds from one jurisdiction to another this is not a simple thing there are there will be cumbersome legal procedures to follow for that that is also concern for them and they have to maintain a corpus of 50 crore to operate in india that is also a concern for these universities so regarding this the national education policy of 2020 says that selected universities will be facilitated to operate in india and for that a legislative framework should be put in place and they have to be given autonomy in terms of governance content etc what is the regulatory framework that has to be put in place all these are espoused by the nep of 2020 so these are all the conditions associated with establishment of foreign university campuses in india uh, the universities which are in the top 500 can apply and they are free to fix their admission criteria as well as fee structure and they have autonomy to recruit faculty and staff from india as well as abroad and they can repatriate funds to their home jurisdiction for example if an american university is coming to india they can shift their profits to their home jurisdiction and they shall not offer any program that jeopardizes india's national interest so these are all the conditions these are kind of important from prelims perspective there can be statement based questions on this more important is the analysis it is criticized that there will be dilution of standards instead of top 100 we are allowing top 500 so that is also 
a case in which we are diluting the standards we are the set we are setting the bar too low and quality of education it should be on par with home campus and the education should not jeopardize the national security of india or the quality of higher education in india already we have premium institutions like iits nits right and if these universities are coming they should add to the environment of higher education in india and they should not jeopardize the quality of higher education in india and academic and financial autonomy in this aspect they have to abide by all the conditions that ugc and the government prescribes from time to time and also national security condition so uh, the educational institutions they cannot do anything that is contradictory to security integrity of india and fundamental rights so this might deter some universities which value their at- academic autonomy this might prevent them from coming to india which kind of defeats the purpose and uh, this is seen as a form of import substitution that is we are importing education into india instead of sending our students to abroad but students generally go to abroad not only to earn a degree there are some associated experiences they want post work study visa they want better income opportunities they want better career prospects so a person going to abroad for higher education doesn't have a singular purpose in mind these are all associated purposes even if a foreign educational institute comes to india we can't provide these things in india itself that is also one of the concern so we have seen um, what are the concerns for various stakeholders what are the legal provisions and analysis about this issue next we will move on to next topic it is about light pollution so why is this in news it is because in ladakh uh, there are six hamlets in changtang wildlife sanctuary wherein a dark sky reserve is declared so basically there there must be dark sky there must not be any source of light pollution Uh, this is mainly to facilitate a conducive environment for the astronomical observatories in this area so when has this concept of sky as a natural resource become very popular it became popular when the um, company spacex they wanted to launch starlink constellation of satellites so this constellation of satellites they affected the view of ground based telescopes that is when the concept of sky as a natural resource came into prominence so it is a natural resource which is common for all and in this context there is uh, there was this lacune which came into the fore that is there is no global treaty for light pollution so basically this dark sky reserve means there would be less light pollution zero light pollution so that the astronomical observatories in this area will have the will have a better view of astronomical phenomenon that is the purpose so why this is necessitated is because of a phenomenon called sky glow what is sky glow it is non natural light that has increased the brightness of artificial glow of the night sky so artificial glow of night sky due to artificial lighting that is called as sky glow and this has increased by 9.2 to 10% every year between 2011 and 2022 what is the situation in india as you can see in this picture there is this monastery and when there is a power cut the stars are much beautifully visible most of the stars become invisible if there is light here so that shows what happens in sky glow what 
happens in case of light pollution most of us live in metro cities we seldom see stars that is because of light pollution this happens because even if the light is ground facing the light is reflected back into the sky that is why there is a concept of light pollution so basically in india 19.5% of india's population they have experienced a very high level of sky glow that keeps the entire milky way galaxy out of sight one funny thing also happened in los angeles in 1994 there was a massive power cut and people started calling radio stations to report a very big um, white translucent cloud is appearing in the sky turns out it was the milky way galaxy these people due to light pollution have never seen milky way galaxy and all of a sudden when there was a power cut they could see this galaxy and they thought that is something mysterious similar thing is happening in india also so 19.5% of india's population they experience a level of sky glow that would skip the milky way galaxy out of sight and it would render dark adaptation for human eyes almost impossible because there is constantly light 24 by 7 so our eyes adapt to light and dark right if there is light that is constantly present this dark adaptation itself is rendered useless so that is happening in india and what are the consequences of this so in a 2017 paper it was mentioned that humans tend to use as much artificial light as they can for about 0.7% of gdp when you see the gdp figure 0.7% is a huge figure that much money is spent into buying artificial light so you can imagine the level of sky glow it affects the wildlife say for example sea turtles they don't come to the shore to nest because of light pollution and light pollution keeps trees from sensing seasonal variations even clownfish eggs don't hatch in artificial lighting and insects that is the predator insects they can hunt for longer duration so what happened was there was this convention on migratory species which happened in 2020 at gandhi nagar the parties to this convention decided to do something about this light pollution but to this date there is no comprehensive treaty or convention which exclusively deals with light pollution uh so in humans also artificial light produces some unwarranted consequences that is it hampers the production of melatonin as a result sleep mood cognition all these things are affected and there is circadian disruption circadian or circadian disruption is when our natural sleep cycle which is operating according to the availability of light this circadian rhythm is disrupted and because of this there is 40% increased risk of breast cancer in night shift workers this is just one example light pollution is a very serious issue and there is also a cultural aspect to it in australia or for that matter in many indigenous or tribal communities they have a connect with the stars they have a spiritual connect with the stars because of this ongoing light pollution they are not able to see the stars and it is termed as an ongoing cultural genocide also so light pollution is such a huge problem that it affects our health it affects the planet's health it affects the health of wildlife and trees and it also has wide cultural consequences so this has to be taken seriously then the final article of the day is about ins vagi which is the fifth scorpion class submarine it got commission now let us see about this article this is very important from prelims point of view So this INS Vagir is built under Project Seventy Five, and this Project Seventy Five entails indigenous construction of six submarines. 
and this name is derived from sand fish which is a deep sea predator wagir is a sand fish and this is a diesel electric submarine it's not a nuclear submarine it is just a diesel electric attack submarine and it belongs to kalvari class of submarines we'll see about this kalvari class in the next slide so what are the features of a stealth in this wagir submarine is that there is advanced acoustic absorption technique and there is hydrodynamically optimized shape so that there is less resistance when it travels inside water and low radiated noise because of that this particular submarine will not be detected by other radars and this particular submarine has air independent propulsion uh, so what does it mean that the submarine can say stay under water for quite a long time if they have air independent propulsion system and it operates in all theater the 360 degree operation is possible and there can be interoperability with existing weapon systems that means the existing torpedoes precision guided weapons can be launched from this wagir submarine so this is the kalvari class there are six scorpion class submarines under the project 75 the first one is ins kalvari second one is ins kanderi third one is ins karanj fourth one is ins vela fifth one is ins wagir and the upcoming one is ins wakshir so the capabilities is that they are anti warship and anti submarine enabled and they are used for intelligence gathering as well as surveillance they can be used for naval mine laying speed is not important you need not study that from upsc prelims point of view just know that these kalvari class submarines are under project 75 and these are all the submarines what are the capabilities what is the significance of wagir being inaugurated it enhances the endurance of submarine fleet of india and we have the goal of atmanirbhar force by 2047 because it is indigenously produced it reinforces that goal and it expands the eyesight of naval forces in the indian maritime zone because of its presence intelligence gathering is possible that is what it means when it comes to expanding the eyesight of naval forces they can keep an eye on the indian ocean area they can keep an eye on this theater and tech transfer is coming from french company dcns this simulates indigenous development and from this tech transfer we can use it in other projects as well so today's analysis over and we'll see some questions consider the following statements about light pollution one light pollution also known as photo pollution is the presence of anthropogenic light in the night environment second statement its negative impacts include increasing energy consumption and disrupting the ecosystem and wildlife third one frequent use of led technology increases light pollution which one of the above statements are correct these are all the options the answer is d all of the above i already explained all these statements when i discussed about light pollution next question is about project 75 i is related to which of the following a it is a program launched by the indian navy to build six scorpion class attack submarines b it is an initiative of the government of india to celebrate and commemorate 75 years of progressive india c it is the document released by niti ayog which replaced the five year plans and d it is a program which aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions answer is a it is a program launched by indian navy to build six scorpion class attack submarines so that's all for today's discussion follow us on all the social media platforms like comment share and subscribe today's video this is indumati signing off thank you bye bye